Education and training is a critical aspect in the Government of Alberta's FASD 10-year strategic plan and that it is addressed through various initiatives such as the video conferencing learning series and today we are pleased with the ongoing interest in attendance in looking at this initiative. I have the great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our panel of administrators. Tony McClellan is our moderator today. He is currently the Director of Student Services for Greater St. Albert Catholic Regional School District. During his career, Tony has worked as a psychi psychiatric nurse, teacher, program coordinator, educational behavioral consultant, and psychologist. Most recently, Tony was seconded to Alberta Education, working in the area of funding and the development of standards for early childhood programs for children with special needs, as well as leading the development of resources for students with autism spectrum disorders. He was also seconded to Children's Services as a consultant to the Family Support for Children with Disabilities, FSCD programs, and the common thread in Tony's career has been his interest in children with disabilities and their families, particularly children with complex disabilities. Tony has a, certi um, has a certificate of psychiatric nursing, bachelor and doctoral degrees in special education, a master's in school psychology, and he's registered with the College of Alberta Psychologists. Welcome, Tony. Mary McGregor. Mary McGregor has served as an educator and administrator for 30 years in public education. 28 years with Sturgeon School Division, fulfilling her roles of teacher, vice principal, principal, director of student services, and associate superintendent. As well, she was a teacher and counselor with York University for four years, and she served as a school board trustee in St. Albert. She holds a master's degree in educational administration and a doctorate in secondary education with a focus on curriculum and human resources. Mary and her husband, Alex have two children who are currently attending university. Monica Mankowski. Monica is the Director of Student Services for Fort McMurray Catholic School District and has been a part of the district team for the past 10 years. She has worked in the area of special education for the past 27 years and has taught elementary to grade 12. Monica has worked with many students with special education and health needs. Welcome. And last but not least, of course, Venta Kasbin, with more than 35 years of professional experience across three continents, Dr. Kasbin remains passionate about students with special needs. She has worked in early screening programs, elementary and high schools and universities. She has researched and published internationally, focusing on teacher training and special education. Dr. Kasbins is currently a school administrator overseeing several programs with Edmonton Public Schools. Please join me in welcoming our panel of administrators for today's discussion. I'd like to turn it over now to Tony McClellan, who will be our moderator for this afternoon's session. Thank you. FSD is particularly challenging for schools. It, it's prevalent, but it's off, it often goes unrecognized or misidentified. It's ambiguous in presentation, and, ambigu and, and ambiguity increases anxiety and stress in everyone. Conservative estimates are between uh, 0.2 to 2 per thousand live births uh, for, for individuals with FAS, FAS, for the syndrome. And estimates are three times that high for individuals who have alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders. So given that, that prevalence rate, every teacher every administrator is going to have to deal with a student, support a student with FS, FASD at some point or other in their careers. Um, it's a leading cause of intellectual uh, disability, but the majority of, of individuals who are affected are fu function in the average range, and that causes confusion, and it often leads to misunderstanding and misidentification. Um, when I did a little bit of looking at the literature, the other thing that, that comes out very clearly is the difference between the primary and, and the secondary disabilities. Primary disabilities is those uh, neurological, uh, regulatory, um, behavioral,
disabilities that are a function of the brain damage that's, that's there. Second, and over which there, there's very little we can do, at least currently. The secondary difficulties or secondary effects are the ones that we're most concerned with in terms of being a, a, from a school perspective. And those secondary effects are, or disabilities are effects that happen over time and are a result of the mismatch between the student and the environment, the unresponsiveness of the environment to the student's needs. I also took a look at educational outcomes, and to my surprise, there's very, very little published on educational outcomes in terms of FASD. Educational success with FASD sets the stage for life for better life outcomes, was one of the clear things that came out of that literature. The other, uh, the other piece that came out of the literature is that um, the early studies suggest that 61% of students who have FASD um, either drop out, are expelled, or are suspended. However, more recent, and that was published in about 1995-96, more recent uh, research is suggesting that with a responsive environment, those kids can complete school and, and, and have a better start in terms of avoiding some of those secondary effects. And the key to establishing a responsive environment is strong, solid administration. Because each of the people on the panel, unfortunately, because each of the panels represents a different context in terms of their, of the schools they represent or school systems they represent, I'm going to ask each one of them to describe the demographics so that uh, you can see that I think we have a cross-section of schools here today. So I will start with Benta. In terms of demographics, um, given, for example, the students in Edmonton Public Schools, we have approximately 80,000 uh, students within the jurisdiction itself. Uh, we also have policies of site-based management, which affect how students are um, congregated, clustered, or they're included. Uh, we have a policy within our jurisdiction that the first school should be the neighborhood school. So oftentimes students will come in to the neighborhood school and then uh, they will continue from there to a more specialized program. We do not have within Edmonton Public Schools any particular specialized programs for children uh, with a diagnosis of FASD. And as uh, Tony has mentioned, one of the challenges is to sift through primary and secondary um, disabilities or conditions because many of them will um, mimic uh, something else or the symptomatology is very much the same. So the overlap with conduct disorders, the overlap that we might have opposition with defiant disorder, anxiety disorders, um, sometimes just kids who are cognitively uh, towards the lower end, um, kids with Asperger's, for example, many of them will have similar presentations and again trying to sort through them, trying to program for them in a particular way uh, can be very, very challenging. Mary, thank you, Becky. Uh, Sturgeon School Division is situated just north of St. Albert, so we're in the rural area north of St. Albert and Edmonton, um, sort of the Bonacord Gibbons, we go as far north as Redwater, um, uh, uh, we go um, east to Nemeo and west to Riviera Kabar. Uh, we serve uh, 4,700 students um, in, of a rural population. Uh, that also includes a military base, tuition students from a uh, local reserve, uh, and a colony. We have a number of foster families and we have some, um, some fairly extensive and large group homes in our area as well. Our programming includes um, gifted and talented, advanced placement, regular student programming, and a range of integrated to congregated programs within the system, currently including a program that is targeting children with brain injury. Um, we have a, a large, for the size of our jurisdiction, a large uh, special needs population. And uh, there seems to be a growing population in the area of both autism and FASD. Hello, I'm Monica from Fort McMurray. Um, Fort McMurray is a rural area, of course, north of Edmonton. It includes as far north as Fort Chippewan, 
down to almost Athabasca. Our Wood Buffalo region includes three jurisdictions, including Fort McMurray Catholic Schools, Fort McMurray Public Schools, and Northland School Division. Fort McMurray Catholic Schools has 4,200 uh, students in nine schools. We're quite compa compact in the Fort McMurray area. And um, surrounding us, though, that we support are five Aboriginal reserves. And uh, these reserves, like I said, go as high as Fort Chippewan down to Janvier. Generally, we provide um, inclusive programming. That is our first choice, just like Benta. And um, that has been actually our history as a school division for the past 20 years. Recently, we have developed more specialized programs to meet the needs of a changing community. And these programs provide uh, supports, more specialized supports for a variety of disabilities. And for students who require a higher level of supports that may not be able to cope in, in the regular classroom. Um, some of our students with FASD are based or are placed into these programs, some of them for short periods, and then return to the regular classroom. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I don't, are there any questions about the, uh, the, the sort of the context of the, the schools? Okay. So I think what we'll do is we'll go on to the the first question, and the question that we would like to ask our panelists is, what administrative issues arise in schools and or districts related to educating students affected by FASD? So what are the things that, uh, that may be somewhat, somewhat unique to this population of students? I've asked Mary to, uh, to take the lead in answering that question, and I think Mary's going to share some information and to get the discussion rolling in terms of, of a slide presentation. Okay. Um, just to start with, um, the, this, the information in this slide presentation isn't taken from textbook. It's taken from uh, discussion with local administration in our system and from my own experience in wor working within our own system. So it's, it's pretty specific to what we see happening, um, what we see happening uh, today in our schools. And in general, the issues tend to be, for students, challenges around their memory, um, their cognitive ability, social interactions, behaviors, emotional well-being, and families. So those are the, that's the broad strokes of some of the things that we see in the schools. Under memory, particularly, um, what we see with uh, many of our children uh, with brain injury, and, and that includes the children that we would uh, identify as FASD, and we are, we are speaking of them as children with brain injury, we see um, a loss often of newly acquired or achieved learning. So information that, they, that is here today is gone tomorrow, which of course causes a great deal of frustration and concern both for the students and for their teachers. Um, comprehension is another piece that we see as being a real difficulty. To read or to observe is one thing, and then to, to interpret that into some kind of understanding, some kind of context that's, that's usable is, is yet another. We see organizational issues for our students, which, um, uh, which means that in terms of sectioning out and sequencing their learning um, is problematic for them, whereas a regular student may simply make a list of the things they need to, they need to learn. A student with brain injury often doesn't see the sequence. Uh, keeping up with the class and being out of step with the instruction that's happening for peers, uh, particularly in an integrated environment, uh, again, is a frustrating experience for both sides, both for the children and for the educators. And uh, remedial options are often few, and there's often stigma attached to attending whatever remedial options might be available. Uh, realistic expectations is another one, often children for themselves, teachers for the children, and often families as well for the children and for the school. Cognitive ability is another piece that we struggle with. Um, as we tried to put together uh, a program that we've actually been quite proud of over time, what we've discovered, of course, is that the many levels of cognitive ability um, you know, are, are a first presenting issue, and the, um, the brain injury and dealing with the brain injury yet a second issue to that. So um, 
differentiated programming is often where we where we look to go, and um, it's it's a word differentiated programming that's come up in the past and is here in the future. It's spoken of in um, setting the direction with Alberta Education, and yet what we know is that it is a complex operation in a classroom to provide differentiated programming, and is often to our students in classroom unavailable for a variety of reasons. Uh, congregated session, uh, uh, um, pro congregated programming offers um, really uh, good focused programming for children who have need. On the other hand, it segregates them from their peers, and so. Uh, in our jurisdiction, we provide both opportunities, so parents and students get to make some of those choices. Um, as a result, those are difficult programs to sustain. Um, independence through curriculum is, of course, what we would like, and that leads us back to that differentiated programming piece. And so trying to provide support for students through the curriculum that they're working with. Social interaction is a big one for our administrators because it, of course, leads to all the behavioral stuff that goes with it as well. Immature approaches to peers uh, causing friction and, alien and alienation is a problem that we see. Uh, Self-regulation, being out of step with social norms. Um, bullying, being the bully and being bullied. Both of those are possible and sometimes both in the same person. Um, learning social skills uh, is a step-by-step -step project and of course the immaturity that often accompanies uh, brain injury and FASD um, contributes to making that step-by-step -step process a challenge. It doesn't appear in the language arts curriculum either. It's something that one has to invent along the way. Um, Others learning to appreciate and understand differences is also an enormous challenge because if one's going to deal with bullying by other children, for example, those children need to understand what the challenges of their peers are. And yet that's another challenge for our classroom teachers. And a huge one for many of our children with disabilities and certainly um, our children with brain injury, loneliness is, um, is something that we often see. Uh, it's a result of many of the social interaction pieces. And another result of all of that, and the frustrations that go with learning, are the behaviors. We see in some of our children some very aggressive tendencies that cause uh, concern for safety for themselves and for others. Um, we also see withdrawal. We, saw, we see children who simply withdraw from the world around them and from their classroom and their peers, that alienation that goes with that. And we see unknown sources of anger and anxiety. I recall a young man who had an outburst in class that we couldn't seem to track. And over time, in interviewing with parents and interviewing with the child, we determined that the actual outburst was an, was an angry, frustrated outburst at his father, who in fact had had a disagreement with him some several days prior to the, prior to the class. It took that long for it to filter through the, the, the brain for that child to come out when it came out. And of course, we always feel responsible when a child um, uh, does outburst, and, and, and really we didn't have control over that, uh, nor could we predict it. So that unpredictable piece is a, is a real challenge for schools. Emotional well-being. Uh, we see children with brain injury engaged in very negative self-talk often uh, around their academic failures, around their peer relations and the loneliness that sometimes accompanies that, around their fami family relations, which are sometimes uh, tumultuous, um, and sometimes uh, with the best intention through restricted and very structured environments to tr try and provide them the support, the, the cost is sometimes that relationship piece that goes with that. And those are some of our most dedicated families. Our families also cause us um, uh, concern from time to time. We, of course, have wonderful, positive, supportive families, often foster families, because children who come to us with FASD often come to us through the foster care system. We often uh, see dysfunction in families where that is not so, where FS FASD is often not even identified. Uh, for a variety of reasons in terms of the assessment that it takes to identify a child with FASD. And that family dysfunction often brings about family violence, evidence of addictions, family breakdown, and all of the stresses on the child that that brings to the classroom. And then there are the expectations. Um, the expectations come from families, and those expectations are sometimes right on, and we as a team work together to make it happen. And sometimes the expectations are built on denial 
regarding the limitations that the child faces in terms of their brain injury. The system challenges, of course, that go with that are building programming that's appropriate, integrated and or congregated, uh, staff education, um, and often we deal with resistance and fear and, um, and, and actual skills and capacity. Um, sometimes set upon teachers with a class of 30 students and provincial achievement tests, uh, a workload that sometimes appears to be unmanageable and unsupported as we talk about differentiated program. We, we currently deal with an IPP process that is a deficit model that deals with all the things that are wrong and what we're going to do to fix them instead of working with where the child is and where we need to go with the child. Um, and we, we often deal with uh, education assistant dependency as more parents and teachers um, cry out for education assistant support in their classrooms um, only to see the child and the teacher and the family dependent on that support instead of building independence into the, into the lives of many of our children, including our FASD children. Um, a system approach, a system approach treat brain injury uh, and FASD as brain injury. Um, start with what the child can do, not with what the child can't do and needs to be fixed. Uh, recognize that executive function is likely a central challenge that we're all dealing with and it is a broad challenge and modify the environment rather than the child. Um, uh, typically um, I hear from an administrator where every second day the child is in the office uh, looking to be suspended for some violent activity out in a, out in a, uh, on the way out to recess, on the way back from recess, when really what we need to be looking at is if the child can't manage going out to recess and back with 200 other children heading out to the main door, then the environment itself somehow needs to be um, modified to meet the child's need as opposed to forcing the child into an existing environment, which is a challenge for administrators and teachers in schools. So those are just some of the things that we uh, discussed as administration in our jurisdiction. Before I ask uh, the monitor comment on, on what they see as some of the central challenges as well. I was curious about your comments about, you drew a distinction about between cognitive delay and then the results of the brain injury as being two issues that have to be dealt with almost separately. Do, would you mind commenting on that a bit? Well, FASD is a, um, it, it's a spectrum disorder, but also it causes a variety of different problems. So if you have a child that is now, now assessing with a 50 IQ, that child can't be dealt with in an FASD environment specifically. They need to be in dealt with in an environment that, that honors their cognitive ability. We have children who are very bright with FASD. Um, who, who suffer terribly knowing that the things that they keep forgetting, knowing that the things that they keep misunderstanding, understanding that they don't have a repertoire and that, and that every time they encounter something new they have a problem with that. Um, and, and they have different issues at the different ends of the cognitive spectrum. And when we tried to put together a program to deal specifically with brain injury, we dealt with it at an elementary and a junior high level, and, and we started at a primary level. What we discovered, of course, is that grouping children with varieties of different cognitive levels doesn't work either, because, of course, the child who's very bright doesn't want to be in the classroom with the child who isn't very bright. The child who is, um, uh, you know, has, has low cognition has a whole different set of needs in terms of order and structure in their day. So um, that's why I, I, I say they're, they're, they're two different things. Thanks. And I'd, I'd like to come back to the bullying and, and exploitation as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm going to turn it over to Venta right now to see if she has some additional comments. Yeah. Well, I do. <laughs> Not uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and again, from an administrative perspective, and these are in no particular order, uh, they touch upon some of the things that uh, Mary has mentioned as well. One of the biggest ones is that the students um, with FASD test higher on cognitive assessments than their social skills um, demonstrate. And so that's often a frustration when we're trying to find additional funding or trying to find support. So. Um, intellectual measurement or cognitive skills do not necessarily say how well these individuals will do socially. Another one is timely access to services and supports, whatever they might be. And in some of the facilities that I'm responsible for now, the transition to adulthood and the transition to the workplace 
uh, because more people lose their jobs because of their social skills in the workplace than whether or not they can actually perform um, the work. The co-occurring issues from an admin perspective, um, the family, child and welfare um, concerns. Again, older students, we have the youth justice system. Um, the accurate diagnosis, because many of the presenting behaviors are so similar. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Asperger's, anxiety disorders, conduct disorders. Kids with marginal cognitive skills, um, oftentimes they are just so closely interrelated and trying to figure them out. I'm just going to take a little bit of a sidebar here, and there are many publications available where we look at trying to discern what is um, something we can deal with, uh, that we can come to grips with and, and work with. So a youngster with FASD, a youngster with attentional difficulties, conduct disorder, they've hit someone. Uh, and, you know, they're at the office or something's going mm -hmm. on. A youngster with FASD, and we talked about the exploitation of the vulnerability. Maybe his friend said, hey, I'll, you know, I'll give you a cigarette or I'll pay you five bucks if you go and hit so-and-so. Well, mm -hmm. they often will do that because they're lonely, because they want friends. Um, an impulsive youngster just hits. You've got someone with attentional difficulties. Whereas a conduct kid will say, I don't care if you pay me, I'm not going to hit them. You know, or I hit them because I wanted to hit them. So we might see the same behavior, but trying to dig down and discern what are the underlying reasons. And the same will apply to the interventions that we're going to use. Um, we're not going to use a verbal intervention with a lot of our kids with FASD because it's hard. It's more difficult to process. We need to be a little more concrete. Um, again, so that was my little sidebar. Another difficulty within jurisdictions and also socially are the zero tolerance policies. Um, trying to make allowances for youngsters who have been set up uh, becomes very difficult because you're supposed to have a zero tolerance policy. That youngster brought a weapon to school. That youngster did something that is um, against your district or your school's code of conduct and policy. Staff morale, um, again, tied into going back to the memory. You know, he knew it yesterday, why can't he do it again today? Uh, becomes very difficult to work with staff, and then again that comes into staff professional development, and also staff self-care. Um, Mary mentioned the intensity of some of the responses. That can be overwhelming. You know, it was a small thing. Why did he react that way or she? You know, it's an overreaction. Um, that's part of the big picture for some of these kids. And so how do we work with staff to deal with that? Um, generalizing skills to multiple environments. So, you know, we do the work prep, we get them ready to go out to the workplace, and they don't transfer the skills. Uh, that is another ongoing challenge. Uh, remembering to teach in a literal rather than a figurative sense. So they get into higher level reading. It's all imagery, uh, what do you predict? by providing some of that differentiated programming and providing more literal work for them to do. You can pass your social studies, you know, at the high school level um, with some very creative approaches, which we've done in terms of providing students with a template. Very formulaic, but you will pass. You may not be standard of excellence. We can do those kinds of things, but working with teachers to say, well, they don't understand this or this or this uh, becomes a challenge. So with staffing, um, maintaining morale, and also finding teachers uh, and support staff who believe in these kids, mm -hmm. who have some hope. Uh, I have a little line in my office that says, trying to find those who are not stuck in the past, regretting the present, and forgetting that the future exists. Thanks, Fanta. Okay. Monica, do you have anything to add there? Um, I wanted to take a little different approach in that I wanted to talk about um, specifically what principals are, are challenged with when they go into the school. And so um, what I find my experience has been, and you've already stated this, Mary and Benta, but I kind of picked four things that I think are, are very specific. Principals may not be familiar or knowledgeable about FAS specifically. And so they're familiar with behavior issues, but generally if there's misdiagnosis and misunderstanding about what this child really needs, the focus gets very um, blurry and foggy, and the programming may not be appropriate to actually what the primary issue is. 
And so um, that's what I hear principals struggling with. Um, previously, students with FASD um, may have not received the supports they required at an earlier age. And so the behaviors have escalated as they've gotten older. And so then the diagnosis becomes more complex. And principals are left with, you know, what do we do next? Certainly the approaches may not be consistent for that student. And that's what Benta was talking about, using very specific, consistent approaches that really benefit FASD students. Um, we have the provincial initiative of F to support FASD, which is a wonderful thing. And we are, we are benefiting that by having a child diagnostic team, which is helping to identify specifically children in care and other students that um, parents may decide to have assessed. But we are learning as we grow, and um, that needs to be said as well. We're learning from that experience, and we don't have all the answers for the FASD students. Um, our regional FASD committees are working to share with schools the knowledge that they require and uh, the strategies that we need to be more consistent, so that's hopeful. But generally, principals are challenged with um, developing appropriate behavior plans for their students. They are um, challenged to be consistent in their approaches, knowing that the teacher assistant, the teacher, and everybody, including parents, are working together. And then training their staff. And when you have inclusive-based programming, you may have your FASD students placed all over the school or all over the district and that presents challenges for us. And so we need to learn and grow on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's kind of key in, in, uh, or a theme that comes up in all three of your responses has been around this idea of expectations. Setting appropriate expectations in terms of families, in terms of, uh, of teachers, and in terms of principals. And I'm wondering if, you would l if anybody would like to com comment on that or maybe offering some ideas or suggestions how that might be improved upon. I, I just uh, I'll speak a little piece to this, and I, and I know that my colleagues here will have lots of great ideas. But, you know, in terms of the expectations, and I'm thinking particularly around families now, Yeah. Um, uh, the word is relationship, and that um, uh, that it's that it's easy for us to get into conflict with families that have unrealistic expectations, or no expectations. Uh, that bo both uh, can be true, and developing that relationship, and sometimes resorting to things like a healthy interactions approach and some some you know some goal setting and some sharing that we're all on the same page with the child and that we're. We're, we're looking for the same thing. We want the child to be successful. And it is sometimes difficult for families to hear um, what it is that the child is having difficulty with and what the child, and the limits to what the child can do and so what it is our next steps look like. So that's that whole, I guess, that IPP process that, uh, but more than that, it takes, I think, a real effort on the part of teachers and administrators to develop relationship with the child and with families. I would like to add to that, Mary, in that uh, as students transition when they're small and then into junior high, there is a grief process in sharing that with families. So building that relationship is critical in order to develop the best kind of wraparound supports for mm -hmm. that child. And piggybacking again a little bit on that and the relationships, um, several things. One is that IPP process, uh, the focus on what the student can do. And you know, if we're ever to work well with families and as a parent too, I love hearing what my child can do. I hate hearing what they can't do. And sometimes I've also uh, thrown into my comments later on, our role as school um, administrators, whether at the school level or jurisdictional level, uh, to try and keep some hope and I have offered uh, myself on occasion, you get worn out if you do it too often, but as an advocate because every time the youngster transitions, for example, mm -hmm. the parents have to, or the family, the caregivers, whoever it is, has to relive 
how bad their youngster is in order to qualify for special services. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not a positive uh, model. We tend to focus on what they can't do rather than what they can do. Um, and working on the can do, again, it's with staff. You know, he knew it yesterday, he can't do it today. Right, but what can he do today? Uh, and let's start, you know, with that and the understanding that people that surround the youngster have about what the spectrum disorder might involve, uh, again, is important. One of the perennial questions that comes, comes up with almost any student with diverse learning needs, but particularly this group of students, is what is the best placement? And it usually comes down to some kind of discussion around inclusion or integration, whatever you want to label it, or some kind of congregated programming or um, some blend. And I'm wondering if you have comments or thoughts about that. I start sometimes, it becomes a difficult decision and again, each situation is unique. But to do that horizon planning, um, let's get away from today. But let's imagine that mm -hmm. your youngster is leaving home. Uh, where do you see them as, a, as an adult? What would you like them to be able to do? How would you like them to be able to live? And then we start working backwards to see what's available in our school, what's available in our jurisdiction, uh, and we start building. And obviously knowing that times will change, you know, if they're just coming out of a preschool program into elementary, it's going to look very different. But people are often quite shocked because, you know, they want to fix the problem right now. But appreciating that many of our strategies take a long time that we have to work on, we have to be diligent, uh, so we look at that horizon. What would you like to see as an adult? What kind of a life would you like to see your child have? And then how do we start to work towards that now? Mary, you're nodding in agreement. Uh, Did you? I am, absolutely. And, I, and, I, and the focus, of course, needs to be the child and not the programs. And that's where we, c we come into some um, interesting challenges because in a system that has both children integrated and some um, congregated opportunities, um, often um, uh, there's a view that the child is difficult, if, especially if the child is particularly difficult to manage in a school setting there's a, often a push from um, either the parent or the teacher or the administrator in the building, depending on you know, what the issues are, to push towards a, a congregated program as opposed to um, an integrated environment. And sometimes it's the right choice, and sometimes it isn't. And um, looking, I think, at the whole child, not just at the F FASD, is really important. Does the child have friends, for example? Is the child, um, if, where is the child being successful in the school? Is that a success that could be duplicated somewhere else? Sometimes, sometimes a child's successful in one class and not another because of the subject, or sometimes because of the way the class operates. Maybe one class is a little loosey-goosey and the child needs to have a more structured environment. So before we rush off to recommending some kind of specialized programming, we really need to look at what is the capacity of the school and the capacity of the child. And sometimes, and I know that, that in this day and age and with setting the direction and where integration is the word all the time, sometimes I believe that a congregated setting, at least for a while, is a, is a good choice for a child. It isn't always the right choice, but sometimes it is. So I think whenever we get into saying all children should be integrated or all children should be segregated, then we've got a problem. We need to be looking at the child and the child's needs and what what service or provision will help them move to whatever the next level is. Thanks, Mary. I'm, I'm hearing two kind of key things uh, from both of you. One is around the horizon. What is the long, what is the, what is the long term, what is the dream? You know, what is the vision, I should say, of where this child will be? Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing is you're starting from the child and the child's needs. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Monica? No, not at this time. Okay. And I'm just wondering, if just in this discussion that we're having about some of the administrative issues uh, in, in relation to kids with FASD, we've talked about building expectations in families, we've talked about expectations principals and teachers, we've talked about settings, we've talked about just increasing knowledge. Are there any comments or questions you might have for the 
about the panel members. Okay. Well, what it will do is now we'll move on to the next question, which is um, what administrative approaches are most effective? What works in terms of, of administration in the school? And, and perhaps more importantly, what are the resources that are, are required uh, in order to make them happen? And, and I'm going to start with Monica to respond to that. Thank you, Tony. Um, as far as what works best in schools, I think proper identification, again, we've said that so many times, proper identification leads to more appropriate strategies and more appropriate resources. Um, staff are re required to have knowledge and training, specifically in FASD, and how to support students. And then understanding as well that sometimes there are other disabilities that are associated with those children, and you, you need to look at the whole child when you're programming for them. You need to try and place them as close as you can to their peers. They want to be with their peers. And so you look, we often look at the discrepancy that, um, you know, that, that sometimes comes with the child, and that tells us how much support that they require. Um, in our school division, like many other school divisions, we use a lot of sensory integration, uh, sensory buffets, and diets to support the children with their behavioral issues. And that really helps them to be able to focus more and uh, increase their concentration when they're working. And that is the priority. The focus for our FASD students is to really work on their academics, their reading, their math, their writing. How can we get those to the highest level possible so that we can bridge to other post-secondary long term? So those kinds of supports that support reading, we talked about them, reading um, reading one-to-one. -one. It might be a reading re recovery approach. It might be uh, reading with a teacher assistant one-to-one -one, because they can concentrate better. Uh, math support as well. Um, using technology for their literacy and their math skills. How can we build in technology for these students so that they have the supports they need in order to do the literacy activities that they're really interested in. And they do have lots of real life interests. Another component that I find our students need is friendship and social opportunities. And that is so important as they get older. Um, and they want legitimate things. They don't want to always be sent to the ECS classroom so that uh, they can feel like they have contributed to the school. They want to be with their peers and they want to be out doing things that are age appropriate. So if they're in junior high, they want to go to the gym and they want to be in a real gym fitness area and they want to be working out and uh, they want to be wearing the clothes just like other students and peers and they want to fit in. So how can we really develop appropriate social and friendship opportunities for these students when we know that they struggle behaviorally? and we know they don't have the reasoning ability. So what does that really look like? And I think that's where we need to, to grow a bit and learn how to support them there. Um, mentorship programs, I, I heard the word coach today, um, would really be a benefit. And I think that's an area that uh, Alberta Education needs to look at as well, um, as far as mentorship after school activities, um, out of school care programs so that the students can be going to um, social activities, playing games with each other, is a way to support them long term. Um, and I think those three areas really are the priorities. Thank you. You, you mentioned uh, uh, a number of things there that you, you saw as being really critical, the identification staff knowledge. You mentioned some specific approaches to sensory integration. Um, focus on academics, and you identified some some things that would be, are extremely could be extremely helpful or extremely effective. Could you also maybe comment on what resources are needed? As as far as learning materials, learning or material resources is a broad term. Mm -hmm. what, what needs to be there to make it happen? Um, resources like Read and Write Gold, uh, the technology piece is a huge area of growth, I think, and is difficult to challenge for us as administrators just to keep up with the costs of the technology that these students 
um, require. Also getting parents involved with those technology supports and my experience is that often it's difficult to get those technology supports really working in the classroom unless we have parent buy-in and student buy-in as they get older, right? So that, that's a resource that we really need to add more support to. Can we, can we incorporate iPods? Can we have their, their literacy, their stories on tape? Um, those kinds of resources really are benefit. Um, using the computer for their written work, um, using the computer to research information, uh, increasing the font, uh, those kinds of differentiated um, academic things that can work in the regular classroom are very supportive to our students. That suggests a certain flexibility. Absolutely, and as a jurisdiction, um, we're challenged to provide those flexibilities, especially across the school. So if you have one child placed in grade three and one in six and one in eight, um, providing those resources are, is really a growth, growth area that we need to work on. And I would also imagine uh, developing the staff flexibility and understanding. Absolutely. That what the student needs. And that's all part of your training. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll uh, maybe move to Vanta now. Can you give Vanta an opportunity to respond? Top of my list uh, for this particular question about the admin approaches, um, and I'm right with you on the admin knowledge of um, FASD. Uh, that is so uh, important. Current knowledge, uh, historical knowledge, how some of these diagnoses have changed over time, some of the approaches that have been used, and the understanding, even when we're having kind of an off day too, that it is cope, not cure, when you're dealing with a uh, neurological insult, there is damage there that, you know, maybe five years from now, ten years from now, there might be a chemical, uh, there might be a little implant that will close some of those gaps. But we are dealing with something that is inconsistent on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's not something that's going to be fixed. Uh, and so, again, we struggle with a world that wants a cure, a world that wants a fix when they come to a special class temporarily, but after two years it's going to be repaired. Um, it's an endless cycle um, of getting better rather than being completely uh, cured. From an administrator's perspective, sometimes having the strength to stay the course uh, because someone has brought in something else. We often have, um, again, pardon the term, but kind of flaky approaches. There's a uh, someone has picked something up on the internet and it becomes the answer and that's very difficult too to stay the course uh, with difficult families to stay the course uh, with kids who are causing um, anxiety with our staff that we know um, and again rooted in research uh, rooted in strength that this will come out better you know at the other end um, also when working with other agencies that challenge of friendship is really, really hard. Uh, again, it's hard to put in the little sound bites, but I now have youngsters who are the outliers of the outliers. So we have many of them who have been abused, they've been the victims, they've also been the perpetrators, you know, sexually, physically. And so a lot of the friendships, uh, unless they are supervised, so there's something else, that there's a constant supervision element that's required as well, um, may end up breaking the law. So how do we work with those kids? And being frank with some of the care providers who, the youngsters go to endless therapies. They go to play therapy, they go to a cognitive behavioral therapy, they go to something else. To accept, even though I don't like it at this point, that adults are their friends. That they have got a proper social mix, but we've structured it with adults because we've got some of these other very unusual circumstances that do not allow for the safety of some of the other youngsters. And again, those are precious few. Those are the outliers of the outliers. The majority of the kids, these are not the issues, but um, they're always in my brain because <laughs> that's where I'm at. Willingness to do something different. Um, again, rooted in research, rooted in your colleagues to say, well, what have you done? That networking, that co-counseling that we do a lot of. Um, I've got this kid who, and then looking for advice and being will, willing to try something, um, even though it's not what you would normally try with a youngster. I have someone right now who likes to use the term desk arrest. 
Uh, it's got a catchy phrase to it, and it's working with one youngster. It's not working with some of the other ones. I'm coming back to the hiring process, uh, trying to be stringent in terms of skills and attitudes for individuals who work with these kids. And something that's come up in the last few years is the technology point. Technology is part of people's lives. Um, it took me a long time to uh, say, yeah, MP3 players. Well, we now have our whole high school. We download texts. Uh, you can go to the public library and download them. We try to make them a part of the school life because they are outside. Well, where we end up with some of the friction is because everybody's gone to school, and as I look around the room, we remember school from when we went to school, and that's not the way schools look these days. So trying to incorporate technology, how many uh, university students, the courses are all online. So why aren't we providing some online services for some of our students? Um, you know, revisions to the School Act is something else that I'm looking forward to with interest uh, to see how we deliver services, particularly at the high school level for kids. Um, another one from the administrator, and I wish I had more time, I wish I had more energy some days, but including families. Uh, families can often, they've been beaten up, many of them are so reluctant to participate. How can we bring them on board? Because when they're with us, um, everything just works so much more smoothly. Um, and that is, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges, too. We also, in families, work with parents themselves who have been affected by the same medical issues. Um, you know, in some instances, many of our families' parents themselves are the products of exactly what we're talking about. It can be second or third generation. So their distrust of school, their sense of failure um, is very high. So trying to bring them back in and say, we believe in your youngster, we believe that things can be better, um, and sometimes they're not with us for a while. Thanks, Mary. Mary, would you like to add anything to that? Um, just a couple of things, and that is that um, it is, I think, essential that there is special education coordination happening in every school that whether it's a, a special ed coordinator that's identified or whether it's a principal or a vice principal, somebody needs to be the go-to person regarding what, what are my next steps with this child. Because every teacher in every school and every child in every school needs to have, uh, needs to be supported. And, uh, and it's, it, it needs to be someone's role and responsibility to provide that support. That's just in terms of structuring in the school. Um, another piece is flexible thinking because what we've found is what works for one doesn't necessarily work for the other and so there needs to be uh, some flexible thinking and that's where it comes back to that special ed coordination piece because now you've got, you need someone who's going to put on their thinking cap with the rest of the team and try to come up with a, with a structure. Um, children, most children need some kind of structure but for children with FASD and with brain injury the structure needs to be tailored to their needs, not just a general structure. And so again, it's that, it's that support. Small steps learning is another piece. And um, I learned that um, uh, with a little guy in grade two one year about how we walk down to the washroom and back. And we walk down to the washroom with somebody in the hallway and back. And we wash, walk down to the, with, when the principal's in the hallway and back. And uh, just to build a repertoire for those children who can't generalize, so that small step learning needs to be part of the understanding around that PD uh, for children with brain injury. Specialized programs are great, and um, um, we do some really good things in there, but children um, who are diagnosed with brain injury absolutely need integration because it's the peer modeling that helps them, and it's in a, a segregated jail-like setting where we all learn everybody else's bad habits, that's um, a sort of a deadly thing to do for children with FASD. Um, uh, absolutely, we have some supports. I think all of our jurisdictions have some measure of this and they are invaluable. And as setting the direction continues to look at all of these things, I'm certainly hoping we come out in the end with some of those supports still alive and well. And they would be the behavior and autism consultant, the psychiatric nurse that works in some of our very highly specialized programs with children who simply can't manage in an integrated environment. Um, we have a, a psychology team that works together to not only do the assessments but also to work with the OT and the SLP because children's needs 
th they, they span so many different domains that it's important that there's a team approach to making that happen. Parents as partners, partnerships with those folks who have the expertise and are on the cutting edge of whatever the research has to say. Working with people like Dr. Orlovsky at the, Henro, uh, the, at the Glen Rose. Now, he'll probably love it that everybody's going to call him to be a partner, mm -hmm. but um, it's people like that who give us good, good insights into how children um, can be helped in school settings. Um, things like family school liaison and mental health for our families who struggle to keep ends together while they deal with some of the things that they need to deal with in their homes with these children because these children aren't just ours in the school. They certainly um, uh, pose some challenges in the homes. And um, of course that whole piece around supporting differentiated learning because it's still in my mind a very big word that is much more complex than sometimes we, we understand. So how we support that is important. And I think creating in every school um, a, a, a philosophy that says every child, everyone, every day, and not that child's in your classroom this year, I am free and clear because he's not with me because I already did that last year. I think that that's a, a, that's a piece that administrators need to be working on. Thanks, Mary. The, the thing that strikes me in the comments from all three of you is time, one of the big resources. It's the time that it takes uh, for the collaboration, for the support, and um, um, being there to just help understand uh, what the challenges are. One of the things that I, I would like to ask you related to these administrative approaches is this, is this is specific question around discipline. And uh, discipline, and I use discipline in quotation marks. Uh, and I, I wonder if you want to comment or would like to comment on what advice or what you see as appropriate discipline s strategies for uh, students who, who may be a impacted with FASD, and every, every administrator is faced with that. Okay. If I could start with an example from uh, just prior to the holidays, and um, again, trying to remember that some of the statements that I make, I deal with the very, um, pop a population that's not mixed. Um, many of them are, are congregated. So we have a youngster um, who threatened his teacher just prior to Christmas break. And I get the ribbing from our central services that who else calls at 3.32 on a Friday before the holidays about problems. Just as I try to get the staff to stand back and think, this is one of those discipline issues where you stand back and think. So as we debriefed and worked through the process with the youngster, um, you know, I go through the file again because I don't remember everybody's situation exactly. We've got someone who's got a diagnosis of uh, FASD who's cognitively um, within the lower range, who's had lousy school attendance, so even when those literacy supports have been there, have, this youngster's not been able to take advantage of them. We know that there's some family difficulties, again, at the higher level with the justice system, so someone's agitated and we can't do this, we can't allow these kinds of behaviors in the school. Well, the youngster sat down with me. Um, we have to debrief what do you recall of the actual incident, because we're almost two weeks later now. He starts to cry. My teacher thinks I'm dumb. So you go back through the report cards, yes, you know, here we've had a teacher who's been worried about the youngsters reading all the way along but that feeling is transmitted to the student. Um, you know, in the end, we ended up employing, the youngster had sufficient um, connections with his Aboriginal roots, um, so we used an elder as part of the process. Uh, we also used an in-school suspension model because we were able to discern that what he wanted more than anything else was to be with the other kids, and that this impulsive uh, act but rooted in the fact that he felt that his teacher thought he was dumb. Uh, we had a debrief with the teacher as well. Uh, we were able to do something a little bit different, and again, rather than the district policies that we were, um, that, you know, that are set out and that we attempt to work with all the time, but we had to do something different because all we were going to do was drive this youngster away from school. Um, we've had 100% attendance since 
the particular incident. We're only two weeks into school, so it's great. But it's better than it was before. And we've also got a family who is much more responsive because our first um, call to them was, and again, we usually get calls full of lots of expletives from the other end, that we were pushing them out, you know, and you get uh, different cards, a political card, the race card, something else played. So it's turned out to be a, a discipline issue that's been a positive learning experience for so many people involved. And um, I guess I kind of work from the particular examples as well, but to say next time it happens, what, what have we learned from that and how are we going to try in other situations? Mary or Monica, do you have any additional thoughts about COVID Would you like to start, Mary? Sure. Okay. Um, I, I recall a, um, well, first of all, I think that when a threat is made, when, when we're dealing with serious behavior that is, that is threatening, we really do have to go the formal process in terms of determining whether that's an actual threat. So right. some form of a threat assessment, because we do need to take that piece of it seriously. Having said that, once you've done the investigation mm -hmm. and you find that there's a source, a source that can be solved, um, then, of course, we need to go about, uh, go about doing that, and the zero tolerance piece doesn't work very, very well for that. Um, I, recall, I just wanted to recall a comment that Dr. Massey uh, once made to a young teacher who was in the front row while, while the presentation was going on regarding FASD. And the, um, the, the, the teacher said, well, like, how is it that I, I, I wouldn't discipline this child for this behavior mm -hmm. in the classroom when all of the other children are watching? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is the rule in the classroom. So should I not be enforcing the rule? Because how do I know this child is not just, you know, pulling my chain, if you like, in terms of this disability or whatever? And Dr. Massey looked at the, looked at the teacher and said, well, absolutely, if it's important to you to, to, to have consistent discipline in your classroom, you go right ahead, you'll feel much better about it. Mm -hmm. It won't do anything for the student, but it will certainly make you feel much better. And for me, that was the, what, that was the key. What are we disciplining mm -hmm. for? Is it because of is it our need or is it the child's need and I think if we show, focus on the child's need then the discipline is placed appropriately uh, I'm going to back up a bit I agree um, specifically concerning behavior um, I want to go back to saying that prevention is always the key and so our structured environments really do support that child um, and your consistent teachers really do support those children better um, but we need to recognize that our children, our FASD students, are impulsive. And we have to expect that they're going to be impulsive, and you both described that so well. Um, and with that um, response, then we need to help teachers understand what do we need to teach this student to be successful? What is the focus for them? And uh, what are their interests so that we can teach this in a real way for that student? Um, the focus then is what they need to learn and how can they apply it to a variety of situations. Can they do this at home? Can they do this at school? Can they do this in a variety of community settings? Then we know we've done a good job uh, with, with our teaching. But for what's really important I think for these students is less focus on the consequence. Um, because they're impulsive, and I know we do our risk assessments, and we do thorough investigations, and we do interviewing, and all those things, and then we suspend them. Do they really learn anything from that suspension? Is there a real legitimate benefit? And I know sometimes we need to suspend them. That's, that's just the way it is, and I understand that. But how do we keep them in school sometimes with an in-school suspension? How, if they have one-to-one -one support, can we work with them in school and work off that suspension? So the responses do not have to always be the same, and I think that's what you were both trying to say, mm -hmm. is they don't have to be the same. Thank you, Tony. And, and what I'm hearing, I, I think, if I can summarize, is that, that the emphasis needs to be on teaching, teaching that student what's the, uh, what are appropriate behaviors, a larger much greater focus on the prevention rather than on the consequences. Again, in relation to the specific disability and the, um, the ability to learn from a punitive consequence. Mm -hmm. We don't learn well from punitive cons consequences. None of us do. Um, also the question of when you're, or is it the question, the internal question when you're 
when you are responding as an administrator to a, a challenge to a behavioral issue, who is this impacting, right? And I think mm -hmm. that's what you were mm -hmm. getting at there. I also heard a little bit there about, too, about it, in some senses it needs to serve both parties. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's also the responsibility mm -hmm. of the school administrators to, to maintain a safe and caring environment. Mm -hmm. that we're, that's part of the school act, right? Mm -hmm. But by, and so that has to be addressed, but by the same token understanding that there is a difference there that needs to be accommodated in the discipline practice. So uh, again, I want to, you know, if there are any comments from the, the people that we have here or questions, I would welcome them. So yes, please. I was a little curious. Uh, I, I do agree with you. Uh, I mean, but when the kid is causing a problem, um, using strict consequencing might not be the best step. I'm just wondering, and I'm trying to think of, of older students, so junior high, high school, mm -hmm. what would the consequences to their social standing among peers be who witness the, the uh, inconsistent consequences? Do, do you know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you mean. I, um, what what message are you sending to the other mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do they understand that? Mm -hmm. and, and how are they going to change how they accept that student? Exactly. Yeah, and I, that's a great question, and I'm glad I don't have to answer it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, thoughts? That's an endless question um, as a school administrator. And so trying um, very quickly and whether it's a trip to the washroom, uh, so that you can gadget, gather your <coughs> thoughts uh, because we are when it's a safety issue you know in particular so it's what the youngster concerned the environment what everyone else is going to learn from that one of the strategies that we have used um, and we're getting better at it is uh, knowledge and as actually a debrief with the parties concerned um, so for example with our very volatile students, they might witness something that they don't feel is right and they become involved. Um, so we've had to work with them again to explain the situation, explain the circumstances. You may have come in to this at a certain point or again what you witnessed, what is some of the history and again without breaking any confidentiality um, rules to try to do that as best possible. But we also pull the staff together to say how are we going to do this because this is not a, an isolated um, situation for all parties concerned. So a lot of the restorative justice, the healing circles, those kinds of approaches as well where we take into account the multiple players um, and many times too the family uh, to bring them into that. Sometimes there's not enough time, the danger is immediate, um, it becomes fairly cut and dried you know, by tradition, but wherever possible if there are circumstances where we can engage um, the individuals whom that situation impacts, we try very hard to do that. And it has created a much more positive atmosphere and an overall decline in those kinds of incidents as well. I just have a, a, a comment sort of related Please. to that in that, you know, it's, it's interesting how um, in the education system we have become so accepting of differentiated learning and kids understand that other kids in their class um, learn differently and need to work on different kinds of things, yet we haven't transferred that to the differentiated discipline team. And I think that it can be explained in the same way, right? Just as certain individuals need certain um, strategies or accommodations to help them learn, they also need those to help them learn uh, appropriate behavior. I just think it's interesting that as a system we're not as accepting of the differentiated discipline. Tony. I have something to add with that. Um, you asked when there's inconsistency, inconsistencies in the approaches, how do you respond? And I think that goes back to really working on the plan. What are the behaviors that are, are a real problem? And focus on you know, the top three behaviors that you need to address right now. And um, you know, the good thing about behavior, it's often repetitive. So you have many opportunities <laughs> to address that <laughs> issue. And, uh, uh, hopefully you can work through that to teach them what they need to know in those situations and have a backdoor plan, you know, so that you can respond to that in appropriate ways. 
you've got to work with your staff and your teachers to understand it and include those students and your families. And you may include the RCMP. For us, it's the RCMP. It might be the city police because they can be helpful as well as being preventative or any of the other supports, their family uh, support worker, um, you know, a, a, an elder that is close to that child can really support them in improving that behavior concern. Um, now I lost track. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn it to Mary. Um, just sort of three steps on that, and that is that um, the first step, of course, is the teaching of others regarding the differentiated discipline as well as the differentiated programming. And sometimes that's a hard uh, piece to do because there's the confidentiality of the child that is, is also at stake here. So, so um, uh, it depends on the situation about how far you can go with that. Uh, the second piece is sometimes you have to front with the discipline. I agree. Sometimes the other children have to see that this is an inappropriate thing and it won't be tolerated mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But with the child with FASD, you now have to back that up with programming. You can't just go with the discipline piece, whereas another, with a regular child, you might go with the discipline piece. They lose something. They understand that. They don't want to lose it again. They go back into class. With a child with FASD, it needs to be backed with programming now, you know, uh, w with the debrief, with the family, with, uh, with the next steps, with a plan for the next time, mm -hmm. and, um, and, then, and then return uh, to, to class. And sometimes that's for optics as much as it is uh, in terms of that child. But the last piece of that is uh, addressing the environment. Because if a child is, has a repeated behavior, mm. um, then one needs to sit back and look at the environment. You know, when the doctor, when I say to the doctor, 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 every time I do this, my arm hurts, you know what he's going to tell me, stop doing that. And uh, sometimes our, 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 our classroom teachers get wrapped up, I think very understandably, in their programming and their provincial achievement tests and, you know, all of the, the things they have on their plates to do and forget that sometimes you just have to change the environment. Sometimes a little tweak on that environment will keep that same situation from happening the next time. Can I add one more thought to that? As, as far as um, going back to the initial question, what are other parents going to say? And, you know, that can be a really political and difficult situation for us in that um, you have parents that call us and say, you know, this happened and, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? But, in, you know, my experience is recently that you explain um, that you are working on a plan and um, if you give them not breaking, of course, confidentiality, what the parents want is to know that you are working on it and that you are trying to ensure that the safety of others is not going to be affected in the future. And you are putting other th supports in place to make sure that their child is safe and the student that uh, involved is safe as well. Thank you. Your question resonated with me because last year I had a situation where three high school students were involved in drinking. And the consequence, the discipline was to suspend. Two of those uh, students did not have identified disabilities. One had FASD. And I think there's two or parts in terms of a response. One is the understanding of the administrator, that they understand that there is, that the, the, the behavior is a result of brain injury, of executive function, dysfunction. <laughs> impulse control, planning, predicting consequences, all those kinds of things, as opposed to being volitional, thinking about it, knowing what you're getting into. The second part is, as my panelists have, have responded to, is there is a need for some, and what you identified is the messaging, the messaging to the, to the other students, to the staff. So in this situation, two of the kids got th out of school suspensions for three days. This student got an in school suspension for one day with some counseling and that kind of thing. So that there was a consequence, but it, it is a challenge and that was an excellent question and I appreciate you bringing that up. We have, I'd like to move on to the next, being conscious of the time, I'd like to move on to the, actually the fourth question which is what recommendations do you have for, for planners and administrators in order to produce optimal results for students who have FASD? And I'm going to let Mary lead that one. 
Well, uh, hopefully, um, um, sustainable resources are available uh, <laughs> for schools, hospitals, and the services that one needs for these children. Uh, that we have um, continued interagency partnerships because we each bring expertise from different places. Um, hopefully we have um, opportunities, and this is a place I think we could expand on, on those shared effective practices. I think that, that that is something that we could be looking at expanding on. Um, and, and good, good opportunities for dialogue. So. Um, uh, for today, although we're uh, the panel that's presenting, we're also hearing each other's dialogue and I'm learning lots of things as I go along, taking little notes and little tidbits that I'll take back with me. Um, but I think that the core to this is the wisdom in it is hire great teachers. That's, a, that's, the, first, uh, that's the first thing. We need to have great teachers working with our neediest children. And, um, and, and that's sometimes a challenge in the world of transfers and you know, reductions in one school and increase in another school, but I think it's essential that senior administration is clear that we need the best of the best in with our neediest children. Um, build uh, brain injury into teaching strategies. And uh, there are so many children, and I can tell you that the, the common group of children that, that often teachers don't think of as brain injured, because it needs to be a common language are children with learning disabilities. Often children with learning disabilities uh, could actually be diagnosed with organic brain dysfunction, if not injury. And the same is true, whether it's dysfunction or whether it's injury, the treatment is the same to different varying levels depending on where the dysfunction or the injury lives. Start with the, what the child can do, and that's maybe number one. Start with what the child can do, not with the ch what the child can't do, and create the environment that meets that need. And I think if we did those things, good starting places, and I'm sure that my colleagues will have some wonderful other good ideas to add to that. Okay. Martha, would you like to take a Thank you. Um, I want to talk about what you didn't talk about so that I don't repeat too much, but certainly as um, our students get into junior high and high school, they need opportunities for work experience. And that's connecting our interagencies to support that, like um, family services. Um, so when they have a support worker that uh, they, they're allowed to go to work experience, that they're going to be shadowed and supported in that work environment so that they can learn those skills sequenti sequentially. I think that's so important. As well, in, in, in real life, looking at that child long term, what is that student going to be doing in the next five years? Are they going to the gym every day? Maybe that's a good strategy for them to de-escalate their behavior during school. So how can we interagency look at this child to support them at school, at home, and in the community in real you know, life ways, I think is important. Tony talked about the times that's required for us to do that, and that can be sometimes a barrier, is how do we connect everybody to really focus on that. How do we f support our families um, so that um, they feel more accepted? And it can be, Venta talked about that earlier, about how some of our families really don't feel connected to schools. And, you know, school's not been a very safe place for them. And so now they're trying to send their children to school, but they don't really feel that that place is a good place. So sometimes programs like the FAST program uh, which is a national program that actually supports parenting. It's a social opportunity where you bring families in, not all kinds of families, um, to have dinner, um, to do social activities. And those are school-based programs that we have found very beneficial, especially for families that may have a child with FASD. Um, I think that's it for now. Okay. A couple of things. One, uh, being prepared to modify the environment, uh, not to think that because this worked in one place or because it's worked for me before, uh, that it's going to work the same way again. Um, modeling a calm response. Uh, many of the youngsters, uh, again, with a diagnosis of mm -hmm. FASD, uh, remember how they felt. They don't remember what actually happened. And so, um, Again, another little vignette in my, from my consulting days. We had a youngster who was heavily involved in street culture. 
and talking with the teacher and saying that long-term view, when this youngster has a family, we would like him to bring his family to services. We'd like him to come to the health unit to have his baby checked. All those and what? He's only, he's only in grade four. Um, but yeah, some of these kids that, that planning or again thinking, what are we doing? And touching that affective domain, having them like school, there's ripple effects in the families to have the youngster go home and say, um, gee, I had a good time at school today and this is what I did or this is what I accomplished and this is how I feel about school. So that part is, you know, important. Uh, one of the quirky things too, when we're looking at files, when we're looking at the youngster on paper, which is often how we first see them as administrators, is to look at their adaptive profile. Uh, the cognitive profile may mm -hmm. not tell as much of the story uh, or some of the other circumstances as their adaptive profile. Again, because many of these youngsters will have had some form of assessment along the way. The work experience component, getting along in life, extremely important. We try to provide, again, job coaches. Um, we talk about them in our staff meetings as social interpreters uh, so that these youngsters can be more successful in the workplace. The hiring process, um, I have to give thanks to uh, the jurisdiction that has continued to employ me, uh, quirks and all, but it was a long haul to talk about some of these specialized facilities to say, I'd like to have some curriculum specialists. Um, we will do in-house training on the behavior because then we could adapt um, materials, we could do that differentiated instruction a lot faster because many of the youngsters were falling through the cracks. Again, they mm -hmm. haven't been coming to school, they don't know how to read. Right. So I need someone who can quickly adapt curriculum, will work on the behaviors because we were doing it backwards. Uh, and that has made a, a real difference and in fact, debriefing with some of the kids because I try and talk to them as often as I can, you know, what's the difference? How is the school different for you now? And he said, well, you don't, you know, nag us about, you know, don't bring dope to school, don't do this, don't do that. You nag us to get back to work, you know, <laughs> you've got your essay that you haven't finished. Um, and that was, again, very heartwarming. Um, the wisdom, too, the sharing and the dialogue. You know, every time we have an opportunity like this, as Mary said, she picks up something, she's making notes, and I'm looking over her shoulder to see what <laughs> notes she's making. Uh, very, very important because it's stressful, and when things get stressful, we tend to um, isolate ourselves. And so remembering that there's lots of good people out there who can help us, not being afraid to ask for assistance, using those multidisciplinary resources. Um, sometimes it's hard to take advice when you know you've messed up, but invite them in. It's a good thing to have. Thank you. Um, I think what we, again, conscious of time here, I would just ask if you have, as a panelist, if you have any fi uh, final thoughts. <laughs> I wouldn't be anywhere else except working with these youngsters. Um, every day is different. Uh, every challenge and, you know, I might moan to my colleagues uh, behind closed doors about the time that it takes, but the satisfaction that comes from the work um, is, is, is tremendous. Well, I think I've probably said a lot, but I think that uh, uh, if I was going to say one more thing, and I, and, and I, I agree, and uh, I think that's, that's why I'm still here with all the gray hair, too. Um, that whole mentorship piece, I think, is a really, really important piece. And I don't mean necessarily the mentorship of the new teacher, because the first time you have a child with a severe disability in your classroom makes you a new teacher. The first time you have to deal with a severe disability like a severe FAS child who comes complete wrapped with the, all of the issues in one nice little package, you need help. And so to cultivate that, that, that environment of mentorship, and, and some of our schools have done that, and some of our schools that are fortunate enough to have some of the congregated programs, part of that job is to be a mentor. Is to, is to give and share the knowledge that you've learned about the children in those environments with the other teachers in the school. Because if you're a Chem 30 teacher, you might never have had this experience, and when it does come to you, it's a real shock. It doesn't matter if you've been teaching for 20 years. 
a couple thoughts came to me, and uh, Mary, you said this earlier, is can we refer to um, the student having a brain injury? And I think the language we use is so important. I know it sounds small, but it's so important in how we work with these students. Um, we haven't said enough about being positive, and uh, how can we be more positive to our students with FAS? Um, the, the one thing that, you know, when I reflect, all, all four of us have been talking, we love special education, we've been doing this for years, but um, we have thrown out so many good ideas that the challenge we may leave you with is, what do you, where do you start? What do you do first? And I think you, you really need to look at the child and remember that good, good special ed practice is good practice. And so usually that, that will work out pretty fair for you. And um, if you look at what the child's interests are, that will work out. One of the, uh, I think one of the, th the key points that was brought up right at the beginning of our discussion was this issue of relationship. It's interesting that when I did look at some of the research, and very briefly, that the earlier research had uh, suggested pretty ne negative outcomes for kids who were identified with FASD. More recent research, uh, much of it being qualitative, talked about the number of successes. And when they looked at what constitute, what was key in terms of success, two things came out. One was, a t or it's essentially one with two components, a teacher who's empathetic and willing to accommodate. Mm -hmm. That was the and uh, individual, the, the students who have FASD were asked to describe worst teachers and best teachers. Worst teachers, there was 12, 15 characteristics they could identify. And again, when it came back to the best teachers, it came down to somebody who cared and somebody who's, it, who's willing to, co to, to change or to accept me. Um, I'm wondering now if there, anybody who's sitting here would like to add their final thoughts before we wrap this up. Okay. Well, thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Um, thank you for your ideas and, uh, and your suggestions. Thank you, Tony. Administrative knowledge and expertise is critical, and I believe as administrators we have an obligation to then plant seeds that will encourage others to be informed as well. Working networks, collaboration, we can't do it on our own, and if we don't have family voice and choice as a priority, we're missing a significant link. Team approach, integration of best practices, taking notes from one another, collaborating and sharing the wealth of knowledge that exists needs to be investment. And last but not least, they're not just my children, they're all of our children in this room. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Tony, Mary, Monica, Venta, and all of our special guests. This presentation was not only informative, but inspirational, and we know that the importance of FASD and practice issues for school administrators is going to make a difference. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and have a great day.